Welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay. Welcome to the house and hotel, this splendid luxury sprawl into which I've hit several golf balls in the last few months, given that it sits alongside the Houghton Golf Course, which was the absolute centrepiece of life in Houghton, coming to play golf and have a drink there afterwards. It's still a lovely golf course and a great team, but you also now have the option of drifting around the corner after your round, or just coming through anyway, to enjoy the attractions of the Houghton. Now, normally the chief attraction is Seigneur, Freddy's fabulous restaurant, formerly of the Potluck Club in uh, Cape Town, but now running a great little spot that's accompanied by some terrific wine, and there's plenty of it in the cellar. But today, I'm afraid, Freddy is relegated, much like the golf course, to very much secondary status here in Houghton, because royalty is in town. The King of Chenin Blanc has touched down in his private jet, departing from Somerset West International earlier on this morning. Not for the first time on Dan Really Likes Wine, the warmest of welcomes, Ken Forrester. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you very kindly. Nice of you to rock up for some FMC. I'm very, uh, very proud that you could be here. Thank you, sir. Now it's, it's an illustration of just how little real work you actually do, that in the middle of harvest, when supposedly winemakers are at their busiest ever, you're hanging out with me in a cellar in Joburg having Chenin Blanc for you breakfast. Know, Dan, I'm always admired the way you check your facts, and you need to know it's a rain day. <laughs> I have actually seen it. It's, it's horrendous weather in Cape Town at the moment. <laughs> Cape Town is moody, I think you might say. Moody. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Johannesburg is having a far more pleasant day, and all the more so because you are up, and it's, it's always a delight to spend time with you, but particularly so today, because we're celebrating a bit of history, as well as broadening my Shannon Block knowledge, which I'm always happy to do, and we're doing so with the FMC, and before we get into the vintages, talk about why we've got them here, and why they're here in pairs, as we'll see in a moment, give us a little bit of backstory of the FMC, and, and how this quite marvellous wine came to be. You know, Dan, it was all, it was all just my kind of normal bluster. Um, having got down to the Cape in about 1994, uh, um, bought the vineyard, Martin Minot was kind enough to mentor me. Um, I had to threaten the loss of the dear friendship that he and I enjoyed in those days. But he gave up his day job eventually. But he did mentor me, and at some point I said to him, Martin, we want to make the best white wine in the world. And he was like, oh. <laughs> I said, sure, come on, what's, what's the problem with that? And he said, well, for starters, you've been here about two years. So I said, oh, so there's a limitation. You have to be here 10 years, 20, what's the number? Is there a golden number I should wait? And he said, no, what, what grapes are you going to use? What fruits? I said, we've got that great bush line, Shannon Vineyard, planted in 1970. That'll do it. And he was like, Shannon Blanc, are you kidding me? Best luck in the world? And I said, 100%. That's what we're going to do. Went about banging together a wine in 1997, where we even replaced the heads of the barrel with the acacia heads. We did everything that you've ever seen in any manual on winemaking. We did all of those things and then some. We, you name it, we stirred it anti-clockwise with a left-handed butter. I mean, just about <laughs> everything you could think of. And we got to taste in that wine much, much later in 1997. And that wine was so bad. <laughs> we got it completely wrong. So we did that again in 1998. And we didn't change much because we were sure we were on a winner. And it was shocking. The wine was terrible. So in 1999, we got a little smarter. And we didn't quite interfere so much. And by 2000, we'd kind of come to our senses a little. Took the wine over to the London Wine Trade Fair and showed it to the press at the White Trade Fair and got rave reviews. And suddenly, there I say, in the words of Chris Christophson or something like that, a star was born, you know, here we are. Um, and it's impossible in my reckoning to go back and say, that was 20 years ago. It seems like just the other day. It's 20 years later, this is our 20th vintage of the and it's a wine that has become so iconic for South Africa. We've spoken in the past about me discovering it in restaurants in London, admittedly going for the, the GDP of Lesotho a bottle, but still flying off the shelves because it is so loved by those who've discovered it, and then we'll discover it every single year. But to get to that stage in, in less than 20 years, because it's been there for a while now, is a remarkable achievement. And it speaks to, to one degree about the world discovering just how good our Chenin Blanc is when we make it well instead of relegating it to cheap and inferior versions thereof. 
But there has to be something else. There has to be something beyond just the bluster of Ken Forrester and some old vines and this intent to do something ridiculous, which is kind of your hallmark, that's enabled this to become the wine that it is. Dan, it's a special vineyard. It's a special old vineyard, a lovely parcel. It's planted miraculously in the right place. Somebody got it right nearly 50 years ago. Um, it, it responded very, very well to, to what we've done. We're farming organically with that vineyard. And we harvest by hand, and therein lies the key. We harvest by hand, but we go through and we select. After using some fairly smart technology, which now is quite dated, in fact, it's called NDVI, Normalized Density Vegetative Index. Um, NDVI is an old spy plane technology from the United States, where they would fly around the world at a very high kind of matter, and any time they saw vegetation change, they'd go and investigate what's happening down there. So by adapting that technology, which was brought to the wine industry by Phil Fries, who was a, a great, great viticulturist. He was a Mandavi's viticulturist for many, many years. And Phil Fries pioneered this thing and then got into the wine industry. We started using it about 15, 16 years ago, I guess. We were one of the early adapters in South Africa. And it's a big camera. You fly the camera, you cut a hole in the bottom of a Cessna, and you fly this camera at 3,000 foot. And the camera, one photograph, is about 20 hectares at 3,000 foot. And the resolution is down to 10 centimeters. Where you can pick up a cell phone on the ground from that camera. It's bizarre. It's that good. And what it does is it counts the leaf percentage and gives it an index by separating the growth of the weeds and the stuff in between, the cover crops. So it's a normalized density. It normalizes the vineyard density. And then it gives that an index. And it creates indexes where I can walk into the vineyard, taste, think to myself, hmm, this is nice, where else does it occur? Put it in the GPS, shows me in the rest of the vineyard, there's some over there, there's some over there, some here. We mark it off, and then we go and pick that the next day, marked off, put the pickers inside that zone and say, go through and select all the grapes that look the same, all the bunches that look identical. That fruit that we pick that day is batch one, A. We carry on four days later, B. Carry on, carry on. Normally five or six selections during the drought years, 14, 15, 16, 17, up to 10 or 11 selections. We're now back to seven. So it's quite a process. Seventh selection in the cellar yesterday, which is like a day off. <laughs> well, thank you for spending with me because it's a, it's a fascinating story and understanding just how much work goes into it, I think, helps us to in turn realize why this wine is quite as good as it is. The other way to work out just how good it is, is to actually drink it, which is the far more important reason for us being here together today. Before we open the first bottle, I see we have four in front of us, and they seem to be in pairs. And knowing you, Ken, there's probably a reason for that. There is, and I'm going to break all the rules and show you, because the rules are there to be broken. But um, the rules are youngest before oldest. We're going to drink the oldest wine first, for a good reason, I think. But I'm showing you in pairs, consecutive pairs, consecutive vintages, to highlight really two things. To highlight the fact that one vintage to the next is different, even if it's from the same vintage. It simply didn't rain on Tuesday the 19th of March, both years. Or if it did, not as much, or the wind didn't blow the same way before or after. So there's a rollout of a million things that take place during a growing year. I love the concept. The well-minded people saying, what makes a good vintage? <laughs> <laughs> You've got three weeks, I can explain. <laughs> How long is that? And I don't true? really know what makes a good vintage all on my own either. So, yes, <laughs> here we go. But every time we launch the new vintage, I always get some sort of feedback from uh, good friends, customers, clients, um, people who are importing wine saying, it seems much tighter than last year. It's wine different if you've done something different. Well, no. No. Um, imagine a tottering one-year-old hanging onto the furniture learning to walk, and a two-year-old hellcat tearing the house apart. They're only one year apart. Did you do something different? You doubled the age from one year to the next. I mean, it's the last time they'll be so far apart. As they get older, they obviously get consecutively closer. But yes, it's 50% or 100% older in the first year, and the, the difference is marked. But we'll come to that. I want to start off with the 2006 Six. I think I was still at primary school. I was a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, seven and nine was the best three years of my life. School's fascinating. There's your first glass on the left. 
Yeah. And look at that, golden hue. And take note, on the rim of that hue is a greenish light. There's a green light coming through that. Yes, it's golden, but it's not brown gold, it's green gold. So, <clears throat> it's really in that you can actually get some of that green. Because yeah, it's nothing to do with the golf course outside, which is looking immaculate. I have to say, when we drove up this morning, I thought, fine tasting golf wine to come. <laughs> you know, when you work for a boss like me, it's impossible. No <laughs> I, 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 I look at this, I think, right, well, this is, <coughs> it, if it was purely given to me on visuals, I'd say, oh, that's interesting. I've never had Ken's dessert wine before. Look at the seven next to that. Now, literally, no longer 50% older or younger, just one year. And look at the difference in color. <clears throat> not quite as golden. Six was a warmer year. So, different vintage. And then when we go <clears throat> excuse me, to the nose on these wines, the six is really redolent of ripe pears, apples, almost bruised apple. Um, it, it's very, very apple -y. The seven, not so. The seven is more of honey it's more honeyed, it's, it's a different range of fruit. It's apple pie, in fact, it's like a, when you open the oven or you walk into a kitchen with an apple pie baking, that smell of baked apple is on the seven. And then, finally, one must get to taste them. And when you start with the oldest, which is against the rules, you should start with the youngest. So we go to the oldest first. The angels. Ah. <laughs> mm. Mouthful. Yeah. But with a line of acidity running through the wine, mm. you take an audio cable, a power cord, and you cut it. You have the insulation around the outside and that copper core. It's exactly where you want the acid to be inside the insulation of all the fruit. Wrapped around. The copper core inside, and that's the heart of the wine. And if you go to the seven, that's actually opened up a little now. It's still slightly dusty. Are you with the wine? Totally different in terms of flavor. It's much tighter. It's much leaner. And on analysis, these two wines, so different. The seven happens to be carrying a little more smitten more residual sugar than this. It would almost appear the other way around. Yeah. But these wines are built on their acidity, not so much on anything else. But we literally strive to make the tightest, purest, cleanest wine so that it has ageability. We want it to get to 20 years old. We've got some of these, the original vintage, which are just immaculate. Honest, honestly speaking, when you made this first vintage, 2006, did you think that in 2021 we'd still be drinking it at this level? No. The first vintage was 2000, and we made that and went on the Cape Independent Winemakers Guild auction. We were angry at those days. <coughs> Groucho Marx invoked. <laughs> no longer in <laughs> So, um... And we got the record price for white wine joint with Hamilton Russell for their Chardonnay on the day. And that's when I said, okay, well, let's put on our big boy shoes. If that's what we get on auction, take it to the market at that price. And it was a whopping, in 2001, 160 rand a bottle. That was a case price for many wines. That was a out of your head case price, yes. <laughs> <coughs> Absolutely. And it sold? And it sold, thankfully. Thankfully. And we slowly started getting a following for it. It slowly started creating its own market. And it slowly just got going to the stage where today it's not uncommon to find it in top restaurants um, around the world in Nobu, around the world in, in um, a number of good restaurants, Michelin style restaurants per se in New York, the Ritz in London. You can go to name this list of great, great establishments. 
And obviously with the restaurant margin on it, it really looks impressive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it was, it was three years ago, I'm telling you this, I was at uh, Aquavit in London, Michelin yeah. Star restaurant, and three years ago, now it's been more, I think it was 85 quid a bottle, mm. which is about 400,000 rand. Mm. Per se, I think it's $295. Okay. It's proper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Andrew Fairley restaurant, and he's no longer with us, but the Andrew Fairley restaurant at Glen Eagles, I think it was 90 quid a bottle. So it gets around. It gets around. worth every cent. So this is the 18, which I'm going to pour second last. And alongside the 18, I'm going to pour some 19. Now, I just ask you to hold that up for a second. And this is an illustration, despite Ken's advancing years, the strength of the man, he can still hold this bottle, despite the fact that it's got eight kilograms of stickers on. So a good effort there, Ken. Hey, what can I tell you? My illustrious artwork destroyed by stickers. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the 19. And so this is the brand new one. Is the brand new one. This is the launch of today. This is just coming into the market. And 19, you'll note the colour. Still absolutely golden, no doubt about it, but no yellowing happening yet, not seeing that age. But on the 19, look at the green lights in the 19, and that's really quite, quite green through the middle of the wine. And that's its youth, and that same green light in the 18, in fact the wine's almost lime green in the center. It has that wonderful kind of, and for me that green light in the wine is what's going to age. When the wine loses that green light, she done. Time you should drink up. Call your best friends and empty the syrup. Take it off. <laughs> so it's basically the opposite effect to my swimming pool at home, really. <laughs> yes, sort of. Sort of. Mm. So the 18, that rampant two, nearly three-year-old toddler. Absolutely. Mouth filling. And mm. ends completely dry on the palate. And you're almost lip smacking. It sucks that last bit of moisture off, doesn't it? Mm. It's, mm. Which, which for me is drinkability, because then makes you want to have another sip. It's that, yeah, I should have another sip. That's quite nice. I'm still feeling a bit thirsty, a bit parched. It is like that. And that's the 18, literally just getting into its stride. It's only just beginning. 19 is a puppy, infanticide, in fact. <clears throat> Very striking nose. Mm. And the richness and depth of the 19. It literally runs through five or six layers as you get it into your mouth. It's mouth filling, but then boom, boom, it cascades. All the different flavors. There's melon, pineapple, there's some lemon zest, uh, grapefruit perhaps, grapefruit. That kind of citrus, not lemon, but grapefruit. Um, it's just all things happening. They're not yet knitted together. The wine is young. It's still a puppy. This obviously needs some time. It is the launch day, so it's time to get into the marketplace. And it's the sort of wine that, quite honestly, apart from the fact that it's good business, you should buy six bottles at a time. <laughs> because you need to mark them and drink one every six months and watch the evolution of this wine. We've got wines from years apart here, and they are so distinctly different. And it's been wonderful playing them off against each other. It's a journey of discovery for me. How much of a journey of discovery is it still for you, watching your wines unfold? Well, you know, we took some of the guesswork away when we stopped using those desperately unreliable corks. We went to Spruker. I still take a lot of flack from a lot of people. It's not romantic enough. Mills and Boone, good for a romance. Get a Mills and Boone, get a whole series. This is really wine, and I really want to present to the buyer the perfect product. And I can't guarantee it with a cork. There's a good case for the wine industry, actually, to be taken to court on a kind of class action basis. Because winemakers using cork literally know that they're faulty. They're selling something with a latent and patent fault. I'm sure that's not legal. I'm not sure about that, but, oh, we just accept it because it's romantic. Frankly, the romance is lost on me. I like my wines to be in great shape when I open them. And this is what happens. When you look at a wine that's been in bottle since 2006, it's still 
absolutely perfect. Every single bottle is consistently this good. There's no variation. Now, this is just for me an absolute, that's a bonus. I mean, every bottle that, I'm, that I've purchased is going to taste perfect. That's why. And not only is Ken able to produce these wines, but also divide his time between that and making friends in the wine industry by advocating every other winemaker in South Africa gets sued for using corks. So there we go, Ken, your I popularity. Just, it's a question. I don't know. <laughs> I have one final question for you because uh, I know there are many people looking to taste this wine with you today uh, here at the Houghton. We've got up to a point now where I think our Chenin Blanc is being recognised around the world, either in its own or headlining white blends. Is it fair to say, whatever the romance of Pinotage might be, whatever the history of big reds out of the Stellenbosch area, uh, whatever the uh, invasion of the Swartland, and I use that word admiringly because the Swartland has invaded wonderfully and done so much for us, Great job. that Chenin Blanc is, uh, if not defining the South African wine story, then certainly headlining it. You know, Chenin Blanc, I would like to think without a doubt is our white wine, quintessential white wine from South Africa. It's a default. When you say uh, white wine from New Zealand, people say, oh, sorry. When you say white wine from South Africa, it's a shame. I've been in a pub in London a long time ago now, not, not recently, but the blackboard menu would be um, Shannon Blanc, South Africa, Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand, Chardonnay, California, and that's not, they don't even give you the grower, they just tell you the country it's from. Um, you know, that's your glass wine, and Shannon Blanc, South Africa, that's where it's from. And we've got in the ground just about double what the Lower Valley has planted. We have just about two thirds of the world's Shannon Blanc resource in South Africa. There's really no excuse for not getting it right. We should be getting it right. And there are just that many youngsters, what I'm just so thrilled about, so enamored about is that when I started doing this with Martin in 2000, I mean, people asked me when we were barrels from Linton, Shannon Blanc, in expensive French oak barrels, confirming, you do come from Johannesburg, yes, I do, yes, yes, and you've got a return ticket, because this is not going to last. <laughs> well, yes, I use the return ticket today. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that you did, because you've, uh, you've shown us a few things, you've shown us this wonderful ageability of the wine that uh, you bring us. You've also given us that sense of history, and as a, uh, a wine geek and a history geek, I love that, being mm. able to look back in time through the prism of wine. But you've also provided us with your royal entertainment, as you always do. So, yeah. uh, Ken, thank you. I am going to go out dutifully yeah. and uh, buy the 19 by the case load, as instructed, and uh, continue to watch this wine grow its story and its journey and provide so much delight. So, yeah. thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, as always. Lovely sharing wine with you anytime. So there we go, from the Houghton Hotel today, an exclusive with the great Ken Forrester, who's been making wine since the late 1700s, but his uh, piece de resistance, the FMC Chenin Blanc. If you haven't tried some, get some, drink some now, hold on to some more. Either way, you're in for a real treat. Cheers.